Chloe was born and raised in Wisconsin, USA. She re recently graduated from the University of New Hampshire with a student design major in religious studies and a second major in Italian studies. Um, and you'll see that Italian studies piece come out a little bit in this upcoming presentation. Uh, her research interests span many subjects, including geography, food studies, uh, and European Jewish history and culture. She also enjoys exploring the different aspects of the human experience and how the past and present work together or perhaps don't work together. While in the TAM program, um, she spent her first uh, semester uh, here in Chapel Hill, but also spent semesters in Bath, the UK, and Siena, Italy. Outside of the classroom, you might find her reading novels, writing, or trying her hand at foreign languages. She's currently fascinated by Italian and Romanian. Um, so Chloe, I will turn it over to you and introduce your uh, presentation, The Turn of the Static Tides, Radio as a Weapon in the 20th Century Europe. Take it away. So as Jasmine said, I will be talking about radio as a weapon in 20th century Europe, particularly the first half uh, around the times of colonialism and then World War II in Europe. And again, there will be uh, more of a focus on Italy, as Italy is one of my great research passions. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so just a brief overview. I will start by talking about why radio was so important uh, in this era, how it related to colonialism, uh, and then uh, Radio Bari, which was an Italian radio station, well, still is an Italian radio station, um, but its location and some of the strategies it used, uh, the propaganda strategies, then some other radio strategies and uh, what else was going on in other European radio stations, how some of that relates to World War II and uh, the years following World War II. And then I will briefly conclude and I do have a little something extra at the end as well. So why radio? First of all, you have no physical borders. So you don't have to worry about land or sea. Um, all you really need is towers set up. You don't have border guards. You don't have documents. You don't have to deal with any of that. So in theory, radio can reach pretty much anywhere. And along with that, you have the possibility to target specific audiences. So you can cater uh, to what you think your listeners want to hear. Um, and of course, this is something that we see nowadays, too. Um, people want to keep you interested and keep you tuned in. So they will try to uh, tailor their broadcasts and their material to what they think you want to hear. And lastly, radio can be controlled by the state. So particularly in this period, there was it was very difficult to separate radio and the state, um, even if radio was seen as this mouthpiece uh, for individuals. Uh, it was also a mouthpiece for governments to speak through individuals. So there was a great deal of censorship that was sort of cloaked behind this uh, veil of free speech. This brief timeline. In 1924, we saw the beginning of fascist-run radio broadcasts. Um, a few years later, more than 20% of broadcasts had clear fascist pretenses. So this was um, sort of leading into the colonialism years and the World War II years. The next year, Radio Bari in Italy made its first broadcasts. And not a short time after that, it went from pro-Italian to anti-British. So it wasn't just promoting Italy anymore it was actively going against its opponents. And that shift in tone would prove to be very important. 1937, Radio Bari upgrades to daily broadcasts, whereas before it was maybe three or four times a week. And then 1939 on, so when World War II began, uh, the use of radio for propaganda purposes really took off. I have here a map. Um, it's not an exhaustive map of some of the colonial interests of European countries. Uh, so Great Britain 
was looking at Egypt and the Palestinian territories. France had Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. Spain was also interested in Morocco. Italy had Tunisia, Libya, Eritrea, and Ethiopia. And in the meantime, uh, Germany was focusing more on control of Europe. And life in the colonies, of course, was not easy. This was because there were some skewed perceptions of power. So even though the uh, even though the colonized countries were separate from the colonizers, uh, they were still viewed as an extension of the colonizer, but still beneath it. So there were no equal rights. Um, there was a lot of discrimination. Um, bad treatment of the people living in the colonized countries and local populations. There was also this contradictory pressure in Italy's case to grow the Italian population in the colonies while also forbidding interracial relationships. Um, so it was really, there just was no, no good outcome here. Um, the colonized countries were really suffering during this time. Um, because of the actions of the colonizers. With the onset of World War II, uh, the colonies became less important because at least in Italy's case, um, Italy had to focus more on Italy itself and uh, fighting the allied forces. And then the colonies are essentially lost when Italy surrendered. So, Radio Bari, uh, on the left here is a map. The region highlighted in red is Puglia, and that's where the city of Bari is located. Uh, and during my research, I didn't find anything specific as to why station was placed there. Um, I, I have a guess. I would be curious if anyone else has ideas to hear those as well. Then on the right, is a poster from an event, I believe five or six years ago. Um, it's just talking, so the translation would be like the whole history of the first radio, uh, free radio voice of the resistance. That was the event. And the photo itself is what Radio Bari looked like uh, back in the early 1900s. So keep that in mind because that'll come up again later. Some of the strategies that Radio Bari used then. So 1934 begins broadcasting in Arabic. This was to appeal to the colonies in Africa uh, who predominantly spoke Arabic. It quickly realized that colloquial Arabic would get more listeners as opposed to more formal Arabic. And this was because many listeners uh, were not part of an elite upper class it was just everyday people. Maybe they were going to a local cafe and listening to the radio. And of course, in everyday conversations, they weren't going to use more formal Arabic. They were going to use more colloquial Arabic. So this was, um, once it was realized, the colloquial Arabic became the norm for these radio broadcasts. The broadcasts were in three parts. There was Arabic music, so um, an appeal to culture, and then there were news reports and just some general conversations. And the goal here with this propaganda was to find that balance between promoting Italy as an ally or a friend and making everyone else out to be enemies as uh, Radio Bari had done with uh, Great Britain and the BBC. And meanwhile, other things happening so Radio Bari had already intimidated Great Britain and France because of the power that it had over the colonies. Radio Bari had sort of spearheaded, if you will, um, the, prop the radio propaganda strategies in Europe during this time. So it had a lot of power. Uh, Germany and France had some border stations set up, and I can talk more about those if there's time, but they basically had their own little conflict going. 
Great Britain considered jamming Bari or interrupting its broadcasts, but ultimately decided not to for fear of um, creating too much conflict. France's radio colonial station broadcasted some verses of the Quran, which again was to appeal to the um, Muslim listeners, mostly in uh, Africa. And then Germany added some broadcasts in less common European languages, also in Afrikaans. And further, it cautioned Great Britain or the BBC to avoid talking about certain topics, such as its treatment of Jews. So again, trying to intimidate um, Great Britain and um, advance its own personal or its own national goals. So then in 1943, Allied forces landed in Sicily and began to take over radio stations. And what happened was this was a complete 180 because whereas before the radio stations had been broadcasting uh, wartime propaganda, now it was all about liberation. So it was a huge uh, change in what was being broadcasted. The colonial empire, uh, again, was basically disintegrated. Um, Italy had very little uh, control or official control over its colonies at this point. And propaganda sort of uh, faded away as it related to colonialism or war. And the photo here is a commemorative plaque that is in Bari for Radio Bari. And it says, first free voice of the resistance to Nazi fascism in Italy. So to conclude, some of the me methods used were language, depending on country and region, uh, broadcasters would tailor the language they spoke. And also as with the colloquial versus formal Arabic, the tone of the language, religion, like reading from the Quran that uh, France's radio station did, culture, like playing Arabic music, careful attention to presentation. So this is where the censorship comes in. The idea that the separation between the state and the radio was not really there. And lastly, providing a sense of stability. Because again, life was very difficult in this era, but the radio was something that was always there. Uh, three or four times a week, twice a week, five times a week, every day, it didn't matter. It was there at the same time and it had a structure. So it gave people something they could count on, that sense of stability. And finally, uh, here is the event poster, which you will recall from before. And then here is what Radio Bari looks like today. Um, it's the best I could do with Google Street View, uh, but you can see behind the tree there, there is the satellite tower and that is the radio. Um, so if you think about it, some of the strategies that are used today to keep us interested maybe aren't so different from the propaganda that was used back then. Um, that is all I have for you today. I look forward to questions, comments, anything you have. Thank you very much.